Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this session on innovation and sustainable tourism. Uh, we're delighted to have a very diverse uh, and interesting group of uh, panelists here. My name is Jake Keel. I am the Vice President of Sustainability for Grupo Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic. And for the last 16 years, I have been uh, deeply engaged in implementing sustainable programs in Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic in our resort and finding solutions to some of the major challenges that we face, global challenges that we face today, social, environmental, and economic. We have an amazing panel here. We have a huge diversity of speakers and background, and we're going to dive pretty deep into different issues relating to each of the islands and the destinations uh, on this uh, panel. We're going to look at the ways uh, different islands are innovating. We're going to look at how sustainable tourism is being uh, carried out in different places and different situations. We're going to look at priorities from uh, community-based management, from environmental programs. We're going to ask some of the panelists about how the messaging is carrying forward with their guests, with their visitors. How are they speaking to the public about sustainability? Uh, and we're going to try and find out what has happened since the pandemic uh, has, has taken place. What have our speakers learned? What have their destinations done? Uh, we've heard so much about how sustainable tourism is going to be the new tendency coming forward during the recovery from uh, the pandemic, it's particularly in the tourism industry. We've heard so much about how our clients and our customers are going to be looking for uh, more sustainable destinations, more sustainable opportunities. Uh, and we're wanna, we want to find out from our speakers, has that happened? Are they seeing that? Uh, is that a trend that they're following? Uh, are there things that they're doing to capture some of that, uh, some of that idea, some of that trend and find out whether that's going to bring benefit to their region? Or is it something that's just being talked about and it's really not being enacted? Uh, over my career, I've seen that sustainability uh, kind of ebbs and flows in the interest of our customers. We have years where it's an incredibly important thing. People are talking about it and they're booking based on a, a resort or a destination's philosophy and practices and want to participate in a place based on how sustainable or how responsible that destination is. But other years, there are other priorities and people seem to really push towards uh, other things that they're looking for, new experiences, getting uh, out with less people, um, looking for opportunities for uh, participating in their tourism activities, uh, adventure travel. Uh, we've seen so many changes and the pandemic has really thrown a big curveball at all of us in the tourism industry. So I'm really curious to hear from our speakers, uh, what, what have they learned? What are we seeing? Uh, and what can we take away from this going forward? Innovation is a huge component of uh, sustainable tourism. So I'm fascinated to hear what other destinations are doing and how they're handling, um, how they're handling sustainability where they are. Uh, we have a very diverse group of speakers, uh, and I'd also love to hear uh, about our uh, listeners and uh, the audience here. Um, if you could check in on the chat and just tell us where you're coming from, uh, and we will. Uh, we just had a quick poll here, uh, and it looks like we have a, an extremely diverse group um, of where people are connecting from. Uh, we have 22% from Caribbean, 3% from Latin America, 13 from North America, 3% from the Indian Ocean. 12 from the Pacific, nine from Asia, 32% from Europe and 7% from Africa. So you can see that uh, people who are checked in on the, uh, in the, the, the session uh, are coming from a huge variety of backgrounds uh, and really looking forward to hearing from our diverse group of speakers. Um, the way the session will run is we'll hear so, a few presentations here and they're gonna be relatively short. Uh, and then I'll guide our speakers through uh, questions and hopefully as many of you as possible will, will provide questions uh, and be as interactive as possible through the chat, uh, asking different questions of our speakers, asking for more specifics so we can really get as much as we can out of the session. So I'm delighted to be here. I'm really happy uh, to, to have this opportunity to share some time with, with this group uh, and, and thank you all for joining. And so without further ado, we're gonna jump right in to the experience of Mohammed Raid.
uh, the managing, direct, managing director of Maldiv Integrated Tourism Development Corporation. He's going to give us a short presentation of some of the things they're doing in sustainable tourism. So, Mohammed, if you could turn your camera on. Terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Island Innovation, for giving us the opportunity to participate in this magnificent event. I'd like to begin uh, with a brief introduction about our corporation, uh, Maldives Integrated Tourism Development Corporation. It's a 100% Maldivian government, uh, state-owned enterprise mandated with the development of integrated tourism sector in the Maldives. This includes guest houses, city hotels, integrated tourism zones within the island communities as well. Luxury tourism has already been successfully established for the past 49 years. Future tourism diversification foresee the importance of community tourism in the Maldives. So we are moving towards local island tourism, heritage tourism, and rural tourism. Maldives is an archipelago consisting of around 1,190 islands, which is divided into 22 administrative atolls, 188 islands, are currently inhabited by local communities and other 163 individual islands developed as luxury resorts. Tourism is the main industry in the Maldives, contributing 21.5% of the country's GDP. Even with just 50,000 beds in total, Maldives is proudly say that world leading destination. What facilitated this grand award is the government's consistent focus towards make maintaining a more sustainable throughout the 49 years of the industry. We will be proudly celebrating the golden jubilee year of tourism in the year 2022. The current government initiate, uh, administration has undertaken several projects to ensure the sustainable use of the natural resources. The plan mirrors the worldwide initiative of the Global Ocean Alliance to protect at least 30% of the global ocean as marine protected areas by the year 2030. Some of the initiatives that the Maldives has taken in this regard includes sustainable waste management and the government's ambition plan to reach net zero carbon emission by 2030. The current government administration has undertaken several projects to ensure the sustainable use of natural resources. The plan mirrors the worldwide initiative of Global Alliance, Global Alliance to protect 30% of the uh, marine protected areas. Current government plan to several locations is hotspots of community-based tourism. These projects will be designed with an emphasis of achieving sustainability for the growing industry. In doing so, the government hopes to get uh, greater support from local communities to further strengthen the country's effort to preserve in this dream destination for many, many generations to come. The, the state is now offering loans and other soft grants for individuals to set up solar grids on private properties. This initiative will encourage the new, the natives of, uh, to minimize its dependence to fossil fuel and move towards a greener future for the country to rely on renewable energy. His Excellency President Ibrahim Mohamed Saleh has ratified the 10th Amendment to the Maldives Tourism Act, which was passed by the Parliament on 7th December 2020. The new amendment vests the President with the powers to allocate islands for the development of tourist resorts, integrated tourism development zones, tourism related real estate projects, tourist hotels, guest houses, private islands, yacht marinas, and other more tourism related projects. Further, the act does not restrict the powers of local councils to allocate areas for tourism development projects. Island councils retain the authority to do so in the inhabited islands or cities, which lie under the administrative jurisdiction under the provision of the Decentralization Act and in accordance with the approved land use plan. The act also specifies the guidelines under the government under which the government may still, uh, sell shares from the tourist properties where the government holds shares under the joint venture agreement 
with the private investors. The Act also includes various articles to facilitate the growth of the tourism industry and several provisions for the benefit of the Maldivian community. This is a magnificent and adventurous event for the people who would really love to explore the Maldives. We are introducing an international yacht rally by the name of Sawadi Tadatru in February 2022, which will focus on local heritage, rural and sail tourism. This event will directly benefit local communities and provide new opportunities for the Maldives to showcase its culture and rich heritage. Thank you so much once again, Island Innovation, for giving us the wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. Right, thank you so much, Mohammed. It's an excellent uh, overview, uh, terrific look at some of the things that uh, Maldives is doing and look forward to uh, exploring in more detail uh, some of the other uh, programs that you have. Uh, we're going to skip next right to Kirsten Gao, project manager from Scottish Island Passport Project. Good morning, good afternoon. Hi, Tapalev Jake, Agasesh Kumarbo Alaba. Thank you very much, Jake, and good afternoon from Scotland. My name is Kirsten Gao, and I'm one half of the Job Share Project Management team at the Scottish Island Passport Project. Sarah Compton Bishop and I uh, share this full time role from our base on the Isle of Jura in the southwest of Scotland. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the island centered ethos that we use on the project. I'm not really going to talk about the products that we've developed. You're more than welcome to find out more about these at www.islands.scot or indeed head over to your app store where you can download the free version of the Scottish Island Passport app, find your perfect island match, plan your trip and collect passport stamps for the islands that you visit. The Scottish Island Passport is a leader and Scottish government funded project tasked with encouraging more people to visit more of Scotland's islands for more of the year ensuring we work to promote sustainable travel, support the use of, tra of lifeline transport links, and keep our island communities at the heart of everything we do. Both Sarah and I come from mixed professional backgrounds, but we share a common history of both paid and voluntary work in the community sector, and particularly on islands. Being islanders ourselves, and I've lived here on and off since I was six years old, we're often frustrated by, by projects which parachute into our islands, claiming to be this amazing new thing for the community without ever actually having spoken to anyone who lives here to ask about our aspirations or how we could work together for mutual benefit. Given this, Sarah and I were determined from the very start of the project to ensure that we keep the communities we work with at the heart of everything we do. Not least of all, because we cover 72 islands from Unst in the very northern tip of the British Islands right down to Arran in the southwest of Scotland. We are definitely not experts in each and every one of those islands. So working with the communities on those islands made sense both for islanders and for our audience. There was a brilliant set of findings and recommendations which came out of the community-led tourism session at the Scottish Rural Parliament in March this year, and we'll share a link with these in the chat. The documents discuss many of the points of tension between the economic need for tourism in many of our communities and the threat that tourism itself can pose to the sustainability of those very same communities if it is not sensitive to their needs. At a basic level, the document recognises that it's our communities which create the tourism offer offerings in the areas, setting the tone on the street, as it were, meaning that it's, that it's within everyone's interest to ensure that tourism is supporting communities and not burdening them. The report talks about the challenge of community voices frequently being drowned out by big tourism operators who operate on a national level, and called for a change in engagement narrative at all levels, from one where the tourism sector thrives to alleviate community concerns, to one where the sector and communities collaborate on placemaking. I can highly recommend reading those documents in full. So what does it mean in reality? And what do we mean by an island-centered ethos? In essence, it's an ethos which influences everything we do, 
but I'll break it down into a few key areas that we feel illustrate the kind of approach that we're trying to take. The first area is about actively seeking ways to work with island communities and individual islanders to bring the project to their islands and paying them for the work that they do. The islands we cover are incredibly diverse in terms of population, landscape, industry, infrastructure, and more. And we knew that a one size fits all approach wouldn't work. Often when folk try and take this approach, it's designed for large islands because it's easier, but this doesn't translate well into some of our smaller islands, which may only have a population of say 14 people. So it was crucial for us to recognize the individuality of the 72 islands that we cover, including the differing aspirations and attitudes to tourism. So we spent a lot of time developing our own networks and contacts and identifying key organizations and individuals who can tell us more about their islands and how they would like to be portrayed. Paying islanders for the work they do might seem like a very obvious thing to say. But the reality is that a huge amount of our infrastructure on many of our small islands is often run by overstretched volunteer groups. We know from our own experience that paid employees in media companies, wealthy international drinks companies, and even pod public bodies often seek input from these, uh, from these volunteers to progress their own projects without ever offering to pay for the time and the expertise offered by islanders. Recognizing the wealth of experience and talent that we have in our islands also means we use our networks to actively encourage islanders to apply for opportunities to work with us on the project. And we are incredibly diverse, incredibly proud of the diverse range of island suppliers we've been able to use, which further contributes to our island economies. The next point is about developing resources on an island first basis. This can include considering digital connectivity, but it also includes thinking about what you are asking the communities to do on your behalf. With our physical passports, for example, we've chosen not to ask islanders to shoulder the burden of stamping visitor passports along with everything else they have to do. But instead, we're developing a self-service option for this and paying communities a hosting fee for housing our stamps. Ensuring that we use photography, which includes a variety of aspects of island life, is also key to us. It's really important to us that the islands are recognised not only for their stunning natural beauty and amazing wildlife, but also as living, breathing communities. Echoing this, we're also really careful with our language. We don't tend to use words like remote or wilderness or talk about getting away from it all because we want islanders themselves to recognize the picture that we paint of their islands. There's much more I could say about this ethos, but I will just wrap up by saying that the one other crucial approach for us is ensuring that the voices of contemporary islanders are represented on our steering group and within the wider project to keep us on track. The word contemporary is pretty key here. Our, island, our islands are incredibly special places, and people feel, feel very strong personal connections to them. Many folk who have lived on the mainland for 10, 20, 30 years or more would still call themselves an islander, and it's an incredibly strong part of some people's identity. We do need to be sensitive to that, but ultimately it is our contemporary islanders who are the ones that are keeping day-to-day -day life going on our islands by running businesses, by working in local services, by volunteering and by generally keeping the community alive. They are the experts on our islands and the ones who are best placed to help us understand the needs and opportunities for delivering sustainable tourism offerings, which truly contribute to our islands. Tapale. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Uh, can't wait to dive in more and hear more about how you're interacting with your communities, how you are um, portraying them in this uh, island uh, focused uh, ethos. We'll continue exploring that during the session. So this, now we have two islands that are on, I think all of our bucket lists to visit uh, as soon as possible. So thank you so much for that.
And we'll continue with another island here in, uh, in the region where I am in the Caribbean uh, with Carolyn Truvetsky, chair of the St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association. Uh, Carolyn, good morning. Good morning, and thank you for having me on the panel. I hope you can see uh, my screen. Everything good? You can see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Well, just to introduce myself, I'm Carolyn Trubetskoy. I've lived and worked in the Caribbean for the past 38 years, originally German and now a very proud St. Lucia national. Over the past 25 years or more, I have held a, a great number of different volunteer leadership positions, um, serving as president of the local St. Lucia Hotel Association for four terms and also serving as the president of the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association. Um, recently, I took on the chairmanship of the St. Lucia National Conservation Fund, and I'm also the chairperson of the Education Foundation of the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association. I do have a husband, but I have no other hobbies. Um, speaking of my husband, my husband and I uh, own two beautiful properties in St. Lucia and Chastanay and Shade Mountain. And we've had always, um, before I would say anybody talked about sustainability, we've always had a very strong commitment to sustainable operations. Feel free to look at our websites, anshastne.com and jademountain.com, as I can't go into a lot of detail uh, in this panel. So as you know, as we all know, there have been quite a number of natural disasters affecting Caribbean tourism over the years. Uh, however, nothing has had quite the impact that COVID had, not just on the Caribbean, of course, but also the global tourism industry. And we have been reminded in the worst possible way that the Caribbean is one of the most tourism dependent regions in the world. Out of this pandemic disaster, we have seen, and, and not just in the Caribbean, a renewed desire to create a more sustainable tourism industry of the future. So when we look at the future of tourism, there have been a number of papers published uh, that would address this vision for future, for the future of tourism. For example, the UNWTO published a document that is called the One Planet Vision um, that was published last year. It's still very relevant, highlighting the responsible recovery for people, the planet, and for prosperity. So I would like to say when it comes to vision and aspiration for the future, we certainly are guided at this stage by a great number of publications and also tourism panels like the one today that actively seek solutions. When we are seeking um, sustainable solution in the Caribbean, uh, we need to understand clearly what are the biggest challenges facing us and also understand the hurdles um, that are there that, that prevent us from moving the sustainability needle forward. The big ticket challenges, as I call them, are introduction of more renewable energy, making operators more energy efficient. The whole spectrum of water management, whether we are looking at wastewater, freshwater management, harvesting of rainwater and recreational water quality, there is the overwhelming challenge, not just in the Caribbean, I think on many islands of plastic waste reduction, the issue of recycling and how we deal with our waste and food waste in general. For example, in St. Lucia, we may separate our waste at resort level only for the local waste authority to keep everything back together. So in order to solve these big ticket challenges, we are presented with a number of um, hurdles that we need to solve by both the, and that has to be a private and public sector collaboration. For example, in St. Lucia, when it comes to renewable energy, countries like St. Lucia currently have legislative restrictions that would not allow us to introduce more than 25 kilowatt of renewables into our grid. So when we look at the future, at our future tourism goals, I think once again, the Caribbean regional tourism industry shares common goals. We know where we wanna go with it. Simply put, we want to buy local, promote local and celebrate local. We want to strengthen our small and medium enterprises. We want to create entrepreneurship programs. We want to see more skills development. And we do understand that we need to develop e-commerce platforms to give our MSMEs more visibility and opportunity to market themselves more uh, efficiently. On the developmental side, the vision is to see development away from shorelines. We want developers to adopt to global standards for nature-based solutions and be guided, uh, of course, by sustainable development goals. On the marine and coastal environment side, we realized that a healthy marine environment is essential for the success of our Caribbean tourism destinations. 
So the question is, have we made any progress? I mean, we're certainly not standing still. I would also say that there's a lot of very knowledgeable and passionate experts in the region and that there are, of course, many efforts in shifting the sustainability needle. What I see as one of the biggest hindrances is that very often the reports that are to guide us are really complex. And so there is a need to create some sort of tourism sustainability working groups um, on local level representing public and private sector interests where needed, and to break down the complex requirements into bite-sized pieces and identify what I would call the low-hanging fruit. Now, when we look at the future of tourism through the eyes of the traveler and also through the eyes of the tourism operator, this is another interesting and possibly confusing topic. You can read in the trade press, people want to travel more sustainably, but don't actually do it or perhaps don't know what to look for. On the other side, many tourism trade prof professionals would maintain that travel decisions are still mostly made on price point and not on basis of destination and resort sustainability certifications. I think that it is also confusing to the traveler what precisely they are to look for when it comes to choosing certified resorts or certified destinations. So again, when you look at two operators or travel agencies, they would say, well, there's not enough choice of certified resorts and destinations out there. But then again, from our side, being a hotel operator for the tourism operator in general, it feels like there is a myriad of sustainability certification agencies and websites highlighting resorts with sustainable credentials and having also carbon offset mechanism, mechanisms in place that would support various projects. But again, it's, it, it's confusing and there is quite um, almost too much choice there right now. But the big post-pandemic question is, um, can tourism destinations and individual operators focus on and invest in sustainable operations after such a massive economic downturn? So I would argue that there is an urgent need to make capital available at extremely favorable rates to allow tourism operators to implement more sustainable practices. I mean, there's a lot of discussion out there uh, how to create sustainable funding mechanisms and in particular find ways of having the private sector most notably through, I mean, visiting guests contribute to sustainable development goals. In many Caribbean destinations, um, you will see that they were able to establish so-called tourism enhancement funds, which gives visitor a chance to make a voluntary contribution. How these funds are used and whether they're voluntary or mandatory varies from destination to destination in the Caribbean. There's also a discussion, of course, at this point, whether there needs to be a resilience fee introduced payable, not just by our stayover visitors, but perhaps even by cruise visitors. Um, we also have success stories, especially in the era, area of biodiversity and marine conservation. Since we recognize that a healthy marine and coastal environment is important, um, not just for tourism, but the entire blue economy spectrum, I want to highlight the existence of the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. This fund was established in 2012 and uh, came out of uh, what is called the Caribbean Challenge Initiative, which I would describe as the first Caribbean-centric effort to recognize the importance of preservation of the Caribbean marine environment. This fund has currently um, a conservation finance program anchored by a US 80 million endowment fund. And there's also a climate change program focused on ecosystem-based adaptation with a $50 million sinking fund. So in order to benefit from the Caribbean Diversity, Biodiversity Fund, the Caribbean partner countries, and there's currently 10 of them, they needed to create national conservation trust funds. So what are the opportunities? For more, how do we move from aspiration to implementation? I mean, to me, for mostly, let us not reinvent the wheel, but let's push the, 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 the whole sustainability needle forward together. Based on this, we need to find a way to better information sharing, streamlining of efforts so that we don't waste time with duplication. I mentioned before, we need to create sustainable development committees that survive the five-year election cycle that we see in the Caribbean, um, often after five years, if government chains everybody in, in the whole um, you know, system changes. So we need to have development committees that can provide continuity in this important effort. I would also advocate to support existing Caribbean tourism entities and by supporting them, allowing them to fulfill their purpose, which is often hindered by a lack of capacity or available finance. For example, the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association or Caribbean Tourism Organization. 
And I really feel we need to almost uh, work a little harder to highlight those operators in the Caribbean that have moved the needle, that have really tried to make a difference and introduce sustainability awards that are for the Caribbean. And even though there are some conferences already that address sustainability, they need to happen more often. There needs to be a lot more sustainable tourism training and certification tools that are aimed at our workforce so that we have a much bigger awareness of the topic of sustainable operations. In essence, we need to create a new mindset starting in kindergarten, really. And as we are identifying the famous low-hanging fruit, imagine then you have access to what I would call the Caribbean matchmaking platform where projects in need of funding can be matched with available funding. So lastly, I mean, we, we need more innovative funding mechanisms and um, that is important for both the private and public sector. Um, and there are some innovative digital platforms out there already, for example, uh, at the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States has a digital wallet, there is also private sector um, and uh, uh, entrepreneurial um, apps like Penny Pinch. And then when we look at innovative funding, um, you know, we have heard of debt conversion, there's green resilience bond and blue bonds. That's it in a nutshell. I know I have overstayed my welcome. I do apologize. <laughs> so thank you, Jake. Thank you so much, Carolyn. And, and uh, thanks for that great overview. I think there's, we're already seeing in the Q and A, there's a lot of good questions that have came out of your presentation. So thank you for that. Thank but, you. Uh, terrific presentation. Um, I'll remind everyone also, uh, as uh, James has in the chat, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A so we can keep track of them. Uh, and I'll be using that uh, for, for the discussion as we continue to move forward. Uh, so following um, Carolyn's presentation, we're going to continue on with a presentation by Dorita Mendoza, uh, Tourism Director from the Madeira Tourism Board. Good morning. Or good afternoon. Hello, it's good afternoon here in Madeira. <laughs> so, um, thank you for the invitation. I'm Dorita Mendonça. Uh, since 2017, I am the Regional Tourism Director of Madeira Islands, uh, which has Madeira and Porto Santo, the sister island. And it has been a huge, a very a huge uh, challenge, uh, and as, as well as for everyone working in the, the travel industry. Uh, it's also a big challenge to speak about this beautiful destination in seven minutes, so I'll do my best. <laughs> and I, sm I have a small presentation. Let me just share. Sorry. Should be open. Not open. Sorry. Try again. Oh, having some problems. Shall I go ahead and play the video while you're oh. working? Can out? you see it now? Can no, you see can't. it? We can't see your your screen, unfortunately. Just uh, try again. Okay, here it is. Sorry. Okay. There we go. Back to track. Okay, uh, so I'll just try to give you a, a small overview of Madeira Islands. Uh, we just start with showing our newly uh, launched brand, uh, brands. And our signature is welcoming all. So it's saying that we share our destination with all our visitors. So you're all invited to to visit Madeira, a destination that has been welcoming tourists for centuries. And, uh, and today our uh, challenge was to, to defend or not that what are our view about sustainability. And I would say that for Madeira Islands, uh, this is something natural. It's, uh, it's not a trend for sure. Uh, we truly believe that it's also the future, but it has also been uh, in our past as I will try to show you uh, in these few slides. So we've been uh, consistently uh, involved, involving and trying to develop um, uh, very, uh, all the futures features around sustainability. And it's something, as I said before, very natural for, for all the, the authorities, the private sector involved. And I will try to, to show you just a little bit how uh, 
this is. So, but here are just a few uh, quick facts. We have about 270,000 uh, inhabitants in Madeira. This was discovered, this, uh, these islands were discovered in 1418. So we've been celebra celebrating our 600 uh, years of discovery of Madeira and Porto Santo. And our population is concentrated mainly in the south coast of Madeira. This um, is a very important um, information so what i'd like here to point out is we've been looking for our territory for uh our our species and flora faunas since long ago so we have we've created in 1982 the madeira nature reserve uh, with with which consists of uh, 11 sites so 60 percent of the madeira island territory is protected, somehow protected area. Uh, and in these areas, we have uh, some species in danger of extinction, and we have unique species here from all over uh, uh, that are specific of Madeira. So we are strongly connected to uh, the sustainability development goals, as you can see, just you can, uh, can further give more information or you can ask anything that you you want so uh here i could uh, point out uh, two or three um reserves or um as, as for example laura silva forest which is one of our greatest attractions that many tourists visit along their stay in madeira so uh and it's it has a natural heritage from uh since 1999, okay? It gives beautiful landscapes, luxurious vegetation, uh, and uh, amongst this, uh, these, all of this nature um, uh, landscapes, we can also find those rare species as, for example, the long-toed pigeon, Zeno's petrel, or Madeira Freira petrel, uh, we also have uh, been recognized as Onisco Biosphere Reserve, uh, a small municipality in the north called Santana since 2011, and our sister island, Porto Santo, since 2020, October 2020. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, it, it has been, been very natural for us to integrate uh, sustainable tourism with everything that we need uh, to develop uh, concerning tourism activities. So what we have assisting in these uh, last uh, months uh, after the pandemic is we are welcoming more um, active tourists and younger tourists. The profile of visitors has shifted and we've also been promoting for years now uh, are beautiful attributes that develops and that can um, uh, promote uh, everything that you can see, the Levada walks, jeep tours, canyoning, diving. But then we've also been working on protecting also the nature, nature reserves that where uh, people and visitors uh, can um, can do all these activities. So it's something that has been our consistent concern since we created these nature reserves, but we've also been concerned of how to share them with our visitors. So uh, what we have is we, we try to monitor the activities. We have um, some uh, sites and platforms where, where our visitors can book their activities. They are monitored uh, and uh, uh, we can we keep we can keep track of people that are in the nature, and we also um, try to uh, develop to not to develop but to um, promote uh, rules and uh, best practices in these reserves. But we've never believed in uh, banning people from these sites, so it's something that we've always tried to involve private sector authorities to work how everything can work together uh, and still protect our environment. <clears throat> uh, 
So what happens now is we're welcoming tourists that are looking for sure, looking for smaller places, uh, islands, for places where they can be in the in outside, they can explore activities, young people, uh, families, and Madeira has been working hard and promoting itself as a place that can, can welcome people, welcome uh, all, uh, all uh, ages and uh, people looking for all type of activities. So we're an all year destination and we have beautiful sites in the water, near the, near in the, in the mountains. So it's something that is working uh, for us, uh, fortunately, after the pandemic. Here, I would just uh, want to give you some information that the, the authorities, the government tries to involve the private sector. And uh, this Madeira Circular is a platform where we um, promote uh, projects that follow or try to uh, attain these goals. Uh, so there's a a circular economy working also all around the tourism sector as you can see here in the following slides there's just there's a, just a few examples of uh, private uh, private projects from hotels concerning uh, those goals that i just show you so uh, about energy about local uh, cultural cultural products and um you can also see more information in the Madeira circular. So uh, not only looking at the past, we have to look at the future. We know that we have been integrating sustainable goals in our strategies, in our activity, but we, we've uh, uh, got to a point that we feel now that we must stop and organize all this information, all the projects, find better ways of promoting what we really do on behalf of sustainable sustainability. So uh, we've started engaged in a project to <clears throat> obtain uh, the Global Sustainable Tourism Council certification for destinations just now. So we have a long path ahead, but we're really very confident what we have to do and how we will get there. Uh, now, I would just like to leave you a very quick video about Madeira. It's an invitation, please. Who never visited Madeira, please consider uh, Madeira on your top of mind. It belongs to all of you. I know where, one day, nature chose to live and stay forever. <laughs> and where tradition always has something new to share with us. I know where flavours have been refined for ages. And where the sea carved its most beautiful masterpieces. I know where beaches never end. And where all stories can begin. I know where one day everyone will want to go back. Where can I get this? I know where. In Madeira. Madeira belongs to all. Terrific. Thank you so much, Dorita, for that uh, presentation, uh, for giving us some background on Madeira, and for that video. I think we are now 444 of uh, bucket list places to visit for all of us. So I think we all have some, some work to do to be able to get and visit all of these destinations from Madeira to Maldives and Lucia uh, and, and the Scottish Islands as well. We'll continue now with our last presentation from Carolina, Car Carolina Mendoza. Azores DMO coordinator, the government of Azores, regional director of tourism. Uh, so please turn on your camera, Carolina. I've turned it on. Can you see me? Yes, terrific. Okay, nice. Thank you so much for the invitation, for participating in this uh, online conference. It's a great opportunity to share uh, some insights and highlights about the Azores. Uh, so I also have a small presentation about the Azores. I will just try to share my screen. 
Uh, by the way, I'm here in representation of the Regional Director of Tourism, uh, Rosa Costa. She wasn't available today, but um, I am responsible for some sustainability uh, tourism projects in the Azores. So I will try to, in a short notice, to uh, share with you some highlights and then we can pass on to the Q&A. So are you uh, seeing my screen? Yes? Yes, go ahead. Okay, nice. Uh, so first of all, welcome and very welcome to the first archipelago in the world to be uh, certified as a sustainable um, archipelago and according to uh, the GSTC standards. I know sometimes and uh, according to what uh, Caroline was uh, saying back, then uh, according to a booking report, it's sometimes difficult to find out some sustainable destinations, but uh, we are uh, certified and we're, uh, after this pandemics, we feel very prepared to, to face the, the challenges that the COVID-19 uh, brought us. So for those that don't know, the Azores is an archipelago of nine islands that stand in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, there we are. Uh, and we are uh, more than happy to welcome every single one of you to meet the, the nine islands that we have. Uh, every single one of them really different from each other, very authentic with lots to offer. So due to the multiplicity of natural, historic and cultural resources that the Azores long have been associated to sustainable practices and we are, uh, we, are we belong to um, the UNESCO, we have UNESCO heritage and the uh, biosphere heritage and we have some best practices that I would like to share with you such as uh, the habitat conservation, which almost 25% of our territory uh, is classified as a protected area. 38% uh, of our waste is now recycled, reused, and sent for composting. And uh, almost 40% of the total energy consumed in the Azores comes from renewable resources. We have been recognized by several um, stamps and other certifications such as the top 100 grain destinations, the quality coast, and we were European safest destination in 2021 due to our practices. So the tourism and the Azores have um, seen a, a big cycle of development as a result of the liberalization of the airspace to low cost companies. And we saw uh, this increase with uh, 3 million overnight stays in 2019. But we needed to strengthen the Azores tourism strategy with a clear orientation towards sustainable tourism adapted to our local reality and resilient in the face of the global challenges that lie ahead. So that's why we organized in 2017 and uh, taking the, 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 the challenge and the, the fact that uh, the United Nations considered in 2017 and uh, as the International Year for Sustainable uh, Tourism Development. Uh, we organized this conference in 2017 and there was the commitment of the regional government in the certification of the Azores as a sustainable uh, destination. Uh, and we could involve all, everyone um, as uh, using tourism as a driver for positive change. So we used tourism and involved uh, the government bodies, the local community, the tourists, the voluntary sector, the experts, the specialized media, non-governmental organizations, and of course the tourism industry. And we had meetings in all the nine islands uh, involving the green teams the, and all the stakeholders to, uh, to give contributions for the, the certification process as a sustainable um, destination. And we, are, we could um, achieve this certification in 2000, uh, 2019, in December of 2019. This was um, a, a very collaborative project. Uh, and we decided to, to certificate the region by Earthcheck, the world's leading certification firm for travel and tourism, which is recognized and accredited by uh, GSTC. So 
we do walk the talk. We are a sustainable destination, but we knew that we couldn't stop here. And we must involve even more stakeholders, even more participants in this uh, path towards sustainability. So what have we done? Um, I will show you just in one minute. Uh, now we are the first archipelago in the world with this certification. We belong to a restricted group of just 12 regions and seven countries in the world with this certification and the only region in, the, in Portugal with this certification. So we are a destination that totally leads by differentiation. So as I was saying, what have we done? We wanted to involve the private sector in sustainability, reinforcing even more this positioning towards sustainable development. So we created this project called the Sustainability Charter of EASERS, which is guided by the 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So uh, this project also started in 2017 with only uh, 41 entities that subscribed to the charter. And we now count with almost 150 uh, entities that are now subscribers to the charter. And what do you have to do to be a, a, a subscriber of the Sustainability Charter of the Azers? You may ask, well, the only thing that you, that you have to do is to uh, have three sustainable commitments that are aligned with the SDGs. So in one year, you are uh, totally committed with the SDGs and you have best practices associated with the SDGs. Uh, the subscription is uh, totally voluntary. So every single uh, entity that subscribes to the, the, the charter subscribes voluntarily. And we promote workshops uh, about uh, sustainable management in all uh, nine islands with uh, many working groups and with specialists, local specialists in sustainability that help these private companies and other entities to uh, subscribe to the, to the sustainable charter of the Azers, evaluating their supply chain and uh, mitigating their negative impacts and potentiating the positive impacts on the SDGs. So we are bringing everyone aboard. Um, we feel prepared for this, this recovery. Of course, that uh, uh, the, the, the whole world faces a new challenge. And uh, we were really rising up in tourism with 3 million uh, overnight states, as, as I showed you up, uh, back then. But in 2020, we had a huge a decrease of overnight states and we back off 20 years in tourism. We have numbers, we had numbers that we could back off 20 years in tourism. But uh, according to a, a study uh, that was conducted by a national company, a national consultancy company in tourism, uh, there is a huge, uh, a better, uh, there is a more um, search for dest for destinations with sustainable practices, and there's uh, no doubt that uh, sustainability and safety will mark the right path for the future of this sector, betting on more positive models of tourism. And Booking also sa says that, looking according to their sustainability uh, report, 83% of global travelers think sustainable travel is vital, with 61% saying that the pandemic has made them want to travel more sustainability in the future. And almost all believe that in 2021, there aren't enough sustainable travel options available. So again, I recommend that you can look for, for uh, certifications that are uh, mainly recognized by GSTC as GSTC marks the, um, the sustainable standards and the, 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 all the indicators that are international, internationally accepted for sustainable tourism. Um, and what was our response to, to COVID-19? So uh, first of all, we created the, the clean and safe uh, Azorian stamp according, uh, following the, the example of 
um, turismo de Portugal, Portugal Tourism, and we gave training to the various tourism entrepreneurs about this clean and safe stamp that now can use it in their uh, local lodges and hotels. We also uh, were, uh, accredit were recognized by European safest destinations in 2021, and we followed the ATA COVID-19 health, health and safety uh, guidelines. We also launched the voucher safe destination, focusing on everyone's safety. Uh, it was a stamp uh, or a voucher approved by the regional government and is a measure to encourage all visitors to be tested for um, COVID-19 72 hours prior or on boarding to the region. Uh, I will just give you these highlights if you have and then any questions about this uh, highlights, I will be more than happy to um, answer. And then also we launched the program Viver Usa Surge. So as we are nine islands, we wanted to encourage the internal, tourist, uh, internal tourism. So we were in, with this program, we, was, we were incentivating Azorians to travel to other islands and to um, know more about the other islands instead of just staying in one. So that's how we promoted the internal tourism. This uh, program, Viveros Azores, ended with the in March 2021 with the rise in, with the rise of a new era of accessibility for all Azorians with the Azores Fair. It was a tariff made available to SOTA Air Azores, which is part of the new subsidy for passengers on inter-island travel applicable within the autonomous region of the Azores. So now every resident in the Azores can fly uh, between uh, the islands with only, uh, for only 60 uh, euros go and back. Uh, well, this is what I have to, to share with you. Thank you so much for your attention and I will be more than happy to um, answer to your questions. And uh, we more than welcome everyone that wants to visit the first archipelago in the world to be certified as a sustainable destination by Earthchef. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vicara and Lina. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, you can all turn on your cameras now. We'll do uh, a session of question and answers. I think there's a lot of um, amazing uh, information to cover here. And uh, we have about a half hour left of the session. So what I'd like to do is go around uh, and maybe we'll go in the order of the speakers. We haven't heard from Mohammed in, a, in some time now. So what I'd like to do is just uh, connect on one issue that was brought up, I think in all of the presentations, um, the issue of this tension between having international visitors or uh, people from outside of these communities and your islands visiting and the tensions that creates uh, with the local people and how the, the strategies you've used uh, to really connect with the local people and have them participate in tourism, benefit from tourism, find value from tourism, uh, and, uh, and, and how, that you, how it's been managed in each different place. We've seen a lot of this uh, issue of over-tourism where the, some of these destinations are being loved to death. They're too many people coming and it's too intensive in certain seasons uh, and it's having a huge impact both on the local community but also on the local environment and the local uh, cultural attractions. So if we could start with Mohammed and just talk about how does Maldives uh, engage the local community and what are the strategies you use to ensure that the local people benefit from tourism uh, without putting too much of a stress on the local uh, community. And we'll try and keep uh, your answers short so we can kind of go through and hear from everybody if that's possible. Thank you, Jack. Uh, it is not a question that can be answered in short, I would just say. But here in the Maldives, we have a good strategy to engage the local communities. And one thing I would like to emphasize is uh, for the 49 years we have been enjoying tourism. But only 11 years ago, in the year 2009, only the government gave the permission uh, for the local islands uh, to reside, uh, tourists to reside in the local islands. Meaning to say the local island tourism was introduced 
in only 2009. Previously, it was only the luxury destinations, which we called One Island, One Resort. So it is in high priority uh, with the government also, with the current administration, to have the local communities totally engaged without uh, leaving anyone behind. So, and so the Ministry of Tourism also has started a major diversification project and they have been started uh, traveling throughout the countries and keeping awareness training, even MITDC. Our mandate is also to uh, create awareness, train the local communities towards uh, sustainable tourism and also to introduce community-based tourism. It is in high priority with the government and we do not, uh, at even uh, we have reached 730,000 tourists uh, this year. So I would say that it is not in a mass tourism scale, but we have been doing it carefully uh, sustainably and we believe uh, that our islands will still remain as the leading destination thank you so much kirsten you you talked a lot about your uh, in initiatives with the local community engaging the local community could you talk a little bit about that and how do you balance this problem of over tourism and and providing benefit for the locals yeah sure thanks jake um so I think obviously key to our ethos, uh, our project is more people to more of Scotland's islands for more of the year. So there's a recognition in that, that actually when people think of Scotland's islands, there are the famous ones that people think of, maybe Skye, maybe Arran, maybe Isla, depending on, on what you think of. We, we cover 72 inhabited islands. There are more than that in, in Scotland, but we cover 72. So we're recognizing that actually that there are some benefits to tourism and there are some real pressure points where it is genuinely affecting um, some very real things on the ground, like housing availability, um, like the, uh, the, uh, the uh, opportunity to actually um, service the local community with the basic services, healthcare, kind of, you know, sanitation, that kind of thing. Um, and so we're, we're trying to, and, um, but we also have communities that actually are like, well, we would love some more tourists. And also there are other communities where, well, we get all of our tourists in these two months of the year. However, we have spectacular winters where you can see the Northern Lights, where we have beautiful snow on the mountains. So it's about thinking about that more widely, but actually, um, and we've, we've seen a lot of backlash last year in particular when, when we had lockdown in Scotland and lockdown was alleviated and very understandably people in urban areas were keen to get out and about. Um, and yet I guess what people forget is that it doesn't matter if you live in a beautiful place, we've all been through COVID too and we've all had difficulties too. And so there were a lot, there was a lot of backlash in communities about being um, uh, portrayed as these places to escape um, where there was still some kind of fear around kind of COVID within communities. And so what, how do we deal with that? Speak to people on the islands. You know, they're the ones that can tell you. It, and don't assume that every island is going to be the same. As I say, we cover islands that have got maybe... 8,000 people living on them and, and, and islands with 14 uh, people on them. And, and the approaches on those islands are going to be different. And you have to think as well about how you're adding value to those communities. It's not just about, oh, yeah, but you'll come and people will love the place. Well, people love the place already. How are you adding value to the communities by bringing more people there? Um, and so it's not you're not just alleviating the, the, their concerns about what's already happening, but actually truly adding, collaborating and adding to kind of the community life as well. I, lo I love the term you use, the the. Uh... Uh, community uh, community based ethos. I think it's a it's a terrific term. Carolyn, uh, in Saint Lucia, what have you seen, or even in the Caribbean region, uh, what has been the the challenge to to really finding value for the local communities? Uh, what have been some of the strategies that you've seen that have been very effective? Well, let me approach it from uh, two different perspectives. Um, Tourism, sadly, is still really seen in the Caribbean as a foreign industry. But when COVID happened, I mean, it became very clear that the tourism dollar really trickles down through all industries and uh, it affected yeah. everyone. So in a way, we had to realize that perhaps it wasn't so foreign and that it is really our industry. It's an essential industry for, for our islands. Um, could we do better? Oh, for sure. Um I mean, we, I would say there is definitely an effort coming up. There has been an effort before COVID, but even after COVID now, a much bigger effort to 
to create more inclusivity, to really embrace the communities. In St. Lucia, we, we call this current initiative, the Village Tourism Initiative. And I think that um, in addition to, as I said, you know, really um, highlight what can be purchased locally, also really uh, celebrate and, and promote the, 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 the amazing talent we have in the, in, uh, in the islands. And I think there's a lot to be done. But I am somewhat, I would say, optimistic that, I mean, I'm sorry it took a pandemic, but everybody realizes it's absolutely critical to, to offer more opportunity and to be more inclusive. Yeah, I think that that was very much our experience uh, in the Dominican Republic, a neighboring island to, to St. Lucia. And we uh, discovered that uh, when you have tourism, people maybe don't appreciate it as much and they don't see the benefits uh, economically, and maybe they don't directly work in the tourism industry, but they work in agriculture or in service or in uh, construction or landscaping. And when tourism is no longer there, which we experienced in the pandemic, all of a sudden people begin to realize how important it is to the economy and, and what an important aspect of the economy it is. I think until you're missing it, you sometimes you don't realize uh, that it's there. Um, can, can, can we go over uh, Dorita, I'm sorry, can we look at what Madeira has done? Um, talk quite a bit about uh, the, the local community and uh, the nature-based tourism. How, is, how have you been able to manage uh, tourism and how has it been uh, as effective in terms of uh, benefiting the, the local people? So uh, as, you, as you were saying, and I, I repeat your words that now that we had a big, a huge fall in tourism a, a few months ago or last year, as well as Carolina was saying, we, we stopped. So in Madeira, 20% of jobs are related to tourism. And um, everybody here breeds tourism. We live with the tourists. We don't have spaces or restaurants or places for tourists. We all live and, uh, and do our activities, our shopping, everything together. So uh, it was very uh, sad to see the streets without tourism. It was something unnatural for us. Uh, and uh, as I was saying earlier at my presentation, um, uh, locals, locals have always been involved in, uh, in tourism in a way or another. For example, uh, in our events, the events that are developed by the, the tourism boards, which are big, sometimes they involve 2,000 people, 3,000 people. They're all locals. So we've, we've always had this big connection with tourism. And uh, since the, the pandemic tour, uh, times, so uh, small businesses have been struggling because a lot of business is also designed for, for visitors, for, uh, for activities. We have about 300 small, and they're all almost all small uh, enterprises working uh, with uh, tourism activities in the nature, in the sea, uh, up in the mountains, exploring, canyoning, uh, uh, doing walks. So uh, what we did was we tried to support those companies. We believed that we would be back, that this would, uh, would, uh, would overcome this, this crisis. And uh, what we can see now is we helped those, those companies to uh, save their jobs. And now uh, we are welcoming tourists that are looking, as I was saying, to for smaller places, for um, uh, small islands, places that have a lot of activities to offer. And Madeira, I think we have benefited. We have uh, tried to involve also the population in this recovery. Uh, we have uh, fought, uh, we have tried fighting for their security. So as well as in uh, Surge, we also created uh, uh, um, so the best ways of protecting the population uh, so they wouldn't feel that outsiders, visitors, were bringing uh, uh, the risk of infections. So this is how we work all together with the private sector and with our, uh, with our community and the small businesses to try to get back on track for, uh, to, to really uh, go ahead with our uh, recovery after pandemics. 
Thank you. Carolina, could you tell us a little bit about ASource and how you've been managing the influx of tourists? And then as we've gone through the pandemic, there's been less tourists. Uh, and then how, how have you uh, really emphasized creating value for the, for the local community? Hi, Jake. Just as I um, was referring in my presentation, uh, we are betting a lot in um, our sustainability, our sustainable uh, practices, and what we have been doing um, in the, the certification uh, process of the ASERS as a sustainable destination. So what we want to promote is that we are sustainable and that we are a safe destination. Uh, and as, as, as I presented to you before, uh, we launched uh, some programs to, in, to encourage the internal tourism and to uh, promote uh, the users as a, as a safe destination. So um, now we are uh, seeing a, a, a good recovery. It's, it's, it's coming back together. Uh, we are now seeing more and more tourists um, in uh, every spread out in every island from in every island in the Azores. Uh, we have almost vaccinated every every person in in the Azores. So uh, we it's a, a promising future for for the tourism in the Azores. So I wanted to change a little bit. There's a, a theme. I was trying to capture themes that were discussed or mentioned in, in all of the presentations. And this one is a little more on environmental, uh, on the environmental side. Um, there is a huge push around the world to, uh, to confront climate change, to look at renewable energy and new ways of getting our energy. Um, but often in small islands, we are relatively small contributors to climate change in terms of our energy uh, and though it's it's admirable and we should think about uh, diversifying the energy sources and uh, the way that we produce energy, uh, the, the tension is that often small islands will be the first impacted by the impacts of climate change. Maldives, St. Lucia, places like the Dominican Republic. Um, as climate change happens, as we're getting more severe storm events, as we're getting rising seas, uh, we're getting changes in normal temperatures, uh, things that are happening now in real time and so islands, uh, while we don't contribute a huge amount to climate change necessarily in terms of, uh, you know, our energy production, um, we are going to be impacted. Uh, where I live in the Dominican Republic uh, and neighboring island of Haiti, you know, that, that shares the same island, we are in the top 10 most vulnerable islands in the world to climate change. And yet we're probably not in the top 100 producers, contributors to climate change, uh, to, to you know, carbon emissions. And so how have you uh, balanced that? I know that we all wanna uh, engage in uh, how, how do we produce cleaner energy and renewable energy, but also how do we adapt to climate change? What things are you seeing where you are uh, in terms of adapting to climate change? Um, could leave it open to anyone. I, I know Carolyn will, from uh, St. Lucia will have ideas about this in terms of the work she's done with um, uh, protecting the oceans and things that are happening with the, the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund, but I'll leave it open to, to kind of anyone looking at climate change from an island-based perspective. Carolyn, do you, do you want to start? And we'll, we'll go from there. Um, certainly. Um, well, as you've said, um, I mean, we seem to be certainly sitting at the receiving end of, of the effects of climate change in the Caribbean. And obviously, um, as you know, um, uh, during COP Paris, um, our, our negotiating panel was pushing for the 1.5 to stay alive, which be became the motto. Um, I think that... Um, where we can do a lot of work is really in the areas of coral restoration and protection of mangroves. I think that is uh, certainly two areas. And generally, I think um, we need to be um, perhaps less, less sort of um, short-sighted when it comes to development, especially touristic development, and really take it seriously that with rising oceans that you should take development away from the coastlines. And that means also that you have to perhaps review what is the traditional model of tourism development in the Caribbean and think fresh. So um, other than that, uh, I mean, again, we have a long way to go. Um, 
um, in, with the resilience building, I mean, we have so, from an infrastructural perspective, there's so much work to be done to, to build stronger grids, to, to take some of our cables um, below, uh, below the earth. Um, there is the issue of, um, I think, even with more water management that we are often really hindered by, by, we want to preserve water, we want to harvest water, but our whole distribution system needs to be in some instances exchanged. Um, so I think there's opportunity, uh, but um, um, I would say uh, mostly in the, in the blue economy. Very good, thank you. Mohammed. What, what have you been seeing? I know uh, in your area, the, uh, the interest of what happens in storm events and rising seas, um, you know, I can't imagine that Maldive is a massive contributor to carbon emissions. How are you adapting to this, this change that's coming and we're experiencing now? We have uh, seen 2004 tsunami was badly affected to the Maldives and that was even an alarming factor uh, to this small island nation. And we were very um, uh, hesitant regard after this incident. And uh, the government initiative uh, started even before that, I would say. And uh, as uh, uh, Caroline has mentioned, uh, coral restoration, mangrove protection is also one of the main key factors. And also the new administration has taken a huge uh, step towards uh, sing banning of single-use plastic. But please uh, keep in mind, Maldives is a third world country and uh, there are so many things that we could not immediately or an overnight uh, ban so the government has uh, made a master plan of uh, three to four years uh, banning of single-use plastic. And the first phase has already been done uh, during the end of uh, 2021, June. Few items has been banned and there are another batch of items that will be banned in an another three to four months time. So there are other things as well. And please keep in mind, uh, other than uh, tourism, Maldives is a country with a lot of fishermen. Uh, the fishing industry is also there. So we have to keep in mind the coral restoration, the lagoon protection, and all these things still is the main backbone and the livelihood of the islanders. Not only the tourism, the fishery sector is also equally important thing I would like to highlight in this uh, forum as well, that fisheries is also one of the backbones of the Maldives. So for, even for them, for that sector, it is very important for us to preserve the sustainable environment and also towards the development. Thank you. Kirsten, are, are you seeing impacts from, from climate change where you are? Is there, is there things that are impacting you or is there demand from tourists to be addressing climate change? Yeah, certainly. Um, so just in terms of even just anecdotally, I know that um, summer storms are more frequent. We have uh, we have more frequent disruption to uh, ferries um, in, in our local area um, than we would have maybe expected kind of when we were when I was younger. Um, there is an appetite, certainly within the market, um, uh, within the tourists, uh, within our visitors to um, uh for more sustainable options so it's interesting i can't remember who was saying earlier you know people say that they want more sustainable options but don't necessarily take them up and i think um this is why and they're still very strongly led by price point but i think this is one of the thing one of the responsibilities we have as promoters of tourism within our island areas um to really highlight those options of things that you can do um so one of the things that we're hoping to do <coughs> excuse me with the app is have a rewards program in the app um, which, which rewards you for the desired behavior. Now that could be traveling by public transport, that could be cycling, that could be um, you know, taking part in a local litter pick or you know, beach clean or something like that. So there's various ways that we can, in, I think we need to look at hooks in which we can hook people into um, almost that eco-tourism side of things, actively getting people involved in the places that they visit because we, we really find that, um, People love these places, but our, our islands are amazing and beautiful. And actually, if people can feel that they can contribute to them when they're here, um, and even once they've left by maybe donating to a local charity through the app or something like that, that actually gives them a higher value and a higher connection with the community um, and actually promotes a kind of a longevity of that relationship that they may have either with this particular island or with other islands that, that they that they visit in the future. And one quick thing I, I do want to say is that, you know, it is happening. This, there's lots of little bits of jigsaw that are coming into place um, that our first 
um, into Ireland electric flight happened, I think it was in Orkney, um, kind of just the other month there. Um, and um, also I know people talk about the fact that we're maybe small contributors to kind of carbon emissions. Isla, which is right next door to us, has nine distilleries. It is a beautiful place, but distilleries are heavy industry and they are big users of um, carbon, uh, big users of, of, of kind of energy. And so we, we're seeing a move towards kind of um, people wanting to show their sustainable credentials and therefore looking at things like the use of tidal energy and waste and uh, heat waste recovery and things like that in order to use that as selling points um, for folk that come and visit the islands. It's interesting to say also that in some ways using tourism as a platform for education and, and making... Yeah, 100%. And so previously um, I worked on a community energy project and one of the things that we did was there is a hotel on Isla which is um, uh, which uses ground source heat pumps. But, you know, as a guest there, you would never know it. So we worked with the hotel to kind of um, create a display and talk about it and actually really promote this as, um, as, as something that was... Uh, uh, beneficial to both the community and also, you know, to give visitors a feel good factor and, and, you know, adds to that experience because if people recognize that they feel good because they have engaged in something that promotes sustainability, they are more likely to seek out that kind of action again in the future, if that makes sense. Dorita, what are you seeing uh, in, the, in Madeira? Is there a climate impact on on your destination, and are things that you're doing to, to take that on, and uh, that's having a, an effect for your for your visitors? Uh, yes, of course. Unfortunately, uh, Madeira has also seen so a few natural uh, disasters over the years. We had some floods uh, years ago, fires. So the go regional government is investing. Uh, in the, preventing these uh, in ways that we can, especially uh, working with the with the forest uh, authorities, and um, and we also have uh, what concerns with um, uh, uh, specific projects. We have a specific project called Smart Free Fossil Islands, uh, which is developed in Porto Santo over the, the, the last years. Because if in Madeira we have in our peaks we or in the whole year we can have six or seven times our population in the whole year in Porto Santo in in a precise moment you can have ten times the population so you, this is a, a huge impact in the in the territory and in the environment so um, we are incentivizing business families to adopt uh, cleaner um, or um, other uh, alternative energies like electrical cars. Um, the the fees are higher to take your normal car to Porto Santo from Madeira to Porto Santo. There's a ferry, uh, and uh, and there's also so many incentives and projects concerning the private sector, uh, especially because the, the tourism activity has a huge impact in all our economy that uh, what we do is we recognize the private initiatives um, that tries to uh, save water, save energy. And this is something that has, it's, it's, it's all already in our, in our uh, business, in our culture. Um, so it's a, it's a huge concern and it's, uh, we look ahead and we're, I think it's the same as everybody feels because we look all over the small islands other countries, Europe, and we see all these uh, these changes, climate change. It's something that is frightening, and of course, we've been doing a lot for this, trying to prevent this in the in the, the best way we can. It's not something that has passed by us, unfortunately. We we have to do our best. I think it's interesting. We have such a diverse group uh, of <laughs> around the world. And we're all in some ways feeling yeah, it, climate change and how it's impacting our market. Uh, Carolina, are you are you seeing uh, specific impacts in the Azores on uh, from climate change, or are there things that customers are are concerned about when they visit? Yes, of course. Um, climate change is a, a complex problem that affects not only tourism but also the various other sectors of our society, such as agriculture, our 
uh, other uh, sectors of our economy, uh, it's not an environmental matter. Uh, climate change is a matter, is an economic matter, is a social matter. So everyone gets benefits if we want to mitigate the, the climate change problems and everyone uh, gets uh, injured if we don't do something. Uh, the, the European Union has, has many directives to mitigate the impacts of climate change and we must follow this big carrot that comes from it uh, in European, when we're talking in European um, low, uh, country, uh, countries that belong. Um, but I, I believe that as a complex problem, we need to, to, to do this uh, systemic approach. So what are we doing? As in this process of certifying the Azores as a sustainable destination, we use the tourism as a driver for positive change. So we are involving everyone. The local, the local government gets involved in the different um, regional directions. So regional direction of agriculture, of environment, of uh, the territorial planning, of water, every single one of these government directions is implementing, is now implementing measures to mitigate climate change impacts. And this is uh, not only because of, the, of, of climate change, but it's also because we want to promote a sustainable destination. Also, uh, through the program of the Sustainability Charter of the Azores, where we involve the many private sectors, and we teach them and we give training about um, the systemic approach to sustainability and how they can integrate the SDGs in their supply chain. They are also implementing some uh, measures to mitigate uh, this impact. We are working on uh, 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 more investments to um, promote the consumption of renewable energy and be more and more uh, dependent of renewable energy uh, sources. We have uh, lots of incentives uh, for local community to buy and uh, substitute their uh, vehicles for um, electrical vehicles. So we have now uh, charging electric charging stations in every single island of the Azores. Uh, we are implementing many uh, 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 practices on environmental conservation uh, and we have also uh, implemented some uh, uh, practices that are related to uh, uh, capacity building and training about sustainability for hotels and local lodgings so that the private companies can also implement these best practices in their uh, core business. We are also uh, working with the regional secretary of environment and climate change. Yes, we have a secretary for climate change in the Azores, <laughs> um, in which we want to uh, compensate the, the tourism footprint with some of their uh, projects. So we want to collaborate with them in, in, uh, in some projects that they already are promoting, like the Life IP Climates and other projects that uh, if we col collaborate with them, then we uh, are able possibly to uh, compensate the, and mitigate the, the, the carbon footprint associated to tourism. So it, this is a, a, long, a long run. Uh, sustainability is a continuous and ongoing process. Uh, even though we are a sustainable destination uh, already certified, we, we are certified, we are silver certified, we want to continue this process. We are uh, working in the second year of the certification process. We want to, um, uh, we are working for the gold certification that we hope to conquer it in 2024. But of course, this is an ongoing process and we have lots to do still. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of our, our speakers today. It's been a, a fascinating discussion. Uh, I've learned a lot. I think, uh, I, as I said a, a few times, uh, there's a, now a, five more places I feel like I really want to visit that I have not yet been to. I hope everyone else feels the same, both because they have amazing communities, cultures, and natural resources, but also because of the efforts they're making uh, towards sustainable tourism. I think some of the takeaways are that uh, we have a long way to go. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, sustainability is an evolution, uh, not a, 
uh, a simple um, uh, a simple process. I think it's going to take us time to figure out some of these challenges and the diversity of places uh, around the world. There's different challenges for each one. Um, I think the uh, emphasis uh, that I really enjoyed hearing about from each of the speakers was uh, the local community and the local places and how important that is to solving some of these problems, really needing to listen to local people, engage the local people and have them be part of the solution rather than uh, imposing something. Uh, and I think uh, one of the under underlying threads is that islands have a different reality than other places. Uh, we, we share a lot of experiences uh, and it's uh, great to be able to share uh, our experiences in forums like, like Island Innovation uh, this summit. So it's been a, a great session. I appreciate everybody's input. I appreciate the time you put into to making this happen. Uh, and thanks to, to James and his team for putting this together. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. And, uh, and I hope this was a productive session.